I realized that I've been doing this so long, more than 30 years of, of fair housing litigation, that it gives me a perspective now that I didn't have in previous anniversaries. And it's a perspective where I feel now that it's possible to start to connect the dots. And as I was thinking earlier this spring about where we were at 50 years, I really started to go back and think about how do we connect the dots about both where we've been and where we're going. And, and I, I want to I share with you today a few of the lessons that I've learned and that I think I, 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 some of the lessons from the connecting of these dots from both my experience, what I've seen, and wh what I think is, is important as I deal with these issues um, for such a long period of time. Some of what I'm going to say is pretty sobering. It's pretty tough. Some of the facts and statistics are tough to deal with. Um, but there is a message also that I want to convey to you, one of, of hope and one of progress. So I want you to keep those both in mind. As I talk to you about some of those facts now that I want to start with that are sobering, the place I go is to both statistics and to maps. What I've found is that statistics have a story of their own. They're empirical. They tell you something that many times subjective impressions can't. And at the same time, I've also learned in the world of fair housing that maps also tell a huge story. Um, the pictures are enormous. So I want to first start with a couple um, of, 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 of sort of facts about where we are. If we look at the measures of progress between 50 years ago, 1968, and 2018, in a number of different categories, and we compare how African Americans, where they stand versus um, non-Hispanic whites, the, the facts are pretty stunning. Unemployment is still two times for African Americans what it is for non-Hispanic whites. If we look at home ownership rates, we can see that um, home ownership has gotten worse um, over time. That's the rate at which folks um, are, uh, uh, the, the rate at which they're going to be a homeowner. If we look at incarceration rates, they've gone from six times to eight times um, what it is for uh, African Americans compared to whites. If we look at hourly wages, you can see hourly wages really haven't changed that much in terms of the disparity that we see between 68 and 2018. Dollar amounts may have changed, but the difference hasn't changed. If we look at median household income, you can see in terms of 2016 dollars, again, disparity um, uh, is, is, is about the same proportionately. And if we look at household wealth, and this is really the stunner, and this is the result of the, the, the housing recession, of the crash, the foreclosure crash in 2008, 2009, you can see that still, in terms of household wealth, whites compared to African Americans, 10 times the household, uh, median household wealth. And that, that, of course, reflects the value of the home. Poverty rates, again, the likelihood of being in poverty, uh, much greater still for African Americans 50 years after the fact. And this is one which actually just blew me away. This is infant mortality. Now, this was the study that I actually saw recently in a New York Times Sunday magazine. The, the United States government started looking at African American versus white infant mortality rates back in 1850. That was when we were still in the era of slavery. And you can see this is the, this is the mortality rate per 1,000 births. So you can see that we had a rate here, the, the infant mortality rate um, was, um, was significantly greater for African Americans than for whites in 1850. And you see the numbers, of course, were much higher, 340 to versus 217 out of 1,000. 
In 2018, of course, the number of deaths in absolute terms has gotten better in the sense that we lose fewer babies um, at, at, at birth, but the, the, the disparity in the infant mortality rate has actually gotten worse for African Americans. It's gone um, from uh, 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 what we had uh, before, you can see at a rate, it's gone from about 1.5 to about 2.3. And when folks have been trying to figure out what causes that, these medical studies have control for everything from in terms of income, what, what, you know, what, what economic class you're in, education, what your health situation is, and what they found is that African American women are more likely than white women to give birth to low weight um, uh, infants, newborns. And the theory now that the, that the top doctors have settled on is that it is a stress function that comes from a greater likelihood of experiencing discrimination and insult in the life of an African-American woman compared to the life of a non-Hispanic white woman. That it is a toxic stress factor on the body that is literally combining a life experience with a health outcome. This is something that has perplexed the doctors. I, I, you, you have to Google this and look it up. New York Times, Sunday Magazine, huge study on this. I could go on. I could talk about rates of homelessness. I could talk about exposure to environmental hazards. Both significant disparities between African Americans and whites in today's society. The other thing um, that, um, that I, 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 I want to show, and actually I hope we can get this on, on the screen. This may not be all there. But if you look at patterns of segregation in the, in the United States, you find that if you look at where we live, we are still, as in many cases, in most cities in this country, as segregated now as we were 50 years ago. The patterns of segregation are still there. In some places they've improved, but in most of the major cities, you can see it. And you can see it just by looking at it. You know, in these slides that I'm gonna show you, African American is in the green, and hopefully you can see it at this resolution. The Asian is in the red, the Hispanic is in the orange, and um, non-Hispanic whites are typically in the blue. In Chicago, you can see how clear the patterns of segregation are. This is New York. A little bit hard to see here on this, this resolution, but you're looking at areas of, of, of Brooklyn and, and, and of Queens compared to Manhattan in that slide. In this one, we're looking at Los Angeles, and you can see, uh, if you look at Los Angeles in South Central LA, still, um, we're seeing high concentrations uh, of, uh, of, of minorities in segregated patterns. In DC, really stunning comparison. If you know DC, to the left and to the, and to the upper left is Montgomery County and Northwest DC. To the right is Northeast DC and Prince George's County. You can see the stark difference in terms of where people, where people live. And finally, if we were to look at Cleveland, we would see the same patterns. You see the stark differences of how people are grouped. You know these areas far better than I do, but the color lines are still very much there. One, one step further I wanted to do is I wanted, we did an interesting, an interesting a bit of an analysis here where what we did was I wanted to sort of compare outcomes and place some of, combine these two statistics. I combine the statistics of how we live and the outcomes that we see on top of these patterns of where we live. So this is Memphis. And you can see in downtown Memphis, way over to the left, that's the downtown. And you can see that's white and, and, and then you can see where, where white folk live in Memphis. And you can see how much of it is, is, is segregated again by race. We then mapped on top of that, these are census tracts that have what is called defined having persistent poverty. Persistent poverty is defined as 20% of that tract that's in red. Each one of those tracts, 20% of the population 
lives below the poverty line and has lived below the poverty line for 30 years or more. Look at where they're located, located in the African American area. If we then look at where um, uh, public housing is located, and I don't know if it shows up on the slide, if you can see it, Brian, but um, um, we tracked where the public housing is. Public housing, largely in the minority areas, and bank branch locations. Again, I'm not sure it's coming out of this resolution where you can see, oh yes, it looks, from my angle, looks more like the, the green, those dots there. But going down the middle in the white areas, that's where the bank branch locations are. And then school performance. In ranking by the Department of Education from, worse, from the best schools to the worst schools, the worst schools in, in, a, in a gradation from 0 to 10, with the worst being 9 and 10, the best being 1 and 2. The worst are in red. The best are in the greenish, I think it should be yellow in there. And you can see where the worst schools in Memphis are located. And again, if we look at unemployment rates as of 2016, this is of course general, but for the African American population, unemployment rate 15.1% for whites, 5.3% in Memphis. I can do the same thing in Detroit. You can see in Detroit, that, and that by the way is Eight Mile Road up there in Detroit that makes that looks like an absolute barrier up in the north there from Detroit into the suburbs and above, the color line. Persistent poverty tracks, the same thing. Look at where they're located. If we look at um, location of public housing, again, the, hopefully you can see it's the square boxes, but public housing typically concentrated in the areas of lower opportunity, where HUD had put that housing. And again, school performance, a stunning indication of where the best and the worst schools are located. And of course, unemployment disparities, 14.2% in Detroit for whites, 24% unemployment for African Americans in terms of the 2016 numbers. Now, my next question then is, okay, we've looked at these statistics, we've looked at these maps, and some of it you can say is, how much progress have we made? And for me, as a fair housing lawyer, I, I, step, I take a step back, I said I want to kind of connect the dots, and I'm thinking about, what is the root cause of this? Like, why do we have this? What's the reason for this? And why do we still have it? Why is it still this way today? One answer, in part, has to do with the federal government's role. The federal government, Richard Rothstein's written a very important book called The Color of Law. But a couple of messages from that book. If we look back at an old map from the 1930s, this is the Homeowners Loan Corporation, H-O-L-C map. And the Home Ownership Loan Corporation was a New Deal program that was set up to help folks refinance mortgages so they could get back on their feet in the midst of the Depression. And what they did was they drew maps that in the red shows what they called hazardous areas. That was to tell financial services providers, lenders in particular, don't go in those areas. Don't go in those areas. So if we look at where those areas are, we just took those areas out. These are the hazardous areas and we mapped them, in this case, on top of New Orleans. And then we said, okay, now what, where's the location of public housing? Public housing, largely in these hazardous, formerly hazardous areas. And then we look at where ban the bank branch locations are. That's where do banks think their customers are going to be? Where do they make it easy to get loans? not in the hazardous areas. That's, that's what we see today. And then, of course, if we look and see what's the current population of New Orleans and where do they live, lo and behold, so many of these hazardous areas are still the place where African-American folk live, still to this day. So we start to connect the dots and say, what kind of role did the government have in this? And by the way, these maps that were used by the Home Ownership Loan Corporation, they were then used by the Federal Housing Administration in making decisions about who got insurance for homes. You don't get insurance, you can't get a home, let alone refinance. So think about the long-term consequences. How does that connect with the disparity in home ownership rates, with the disparity in household wealth? 
right? They, there are important historical connections here. All right, we could do the same thing with Milwaukee. These are the ha hazardous areas in Milwaukee. We look at where public housing is largely in those areas. We look at where bank branches are located, not in those areas. We look now at what is the demographic makeup of Milwaukee. You can see that so many of the areas um, are still the minority areas. Of course, some changes with gentrification, but some doesn't. So my first point is some of it, yes, was the federal government and the vestiges of what the federal government did to create these disparities. But now I want to get to the lessons of cases, the lessons that I've learned and lived. And there, I want to divide my cases into roughly two. Um, because those cases, those stories, tell me a lot about why we still are where we are and what we need to do about it. The first group of cases has to do with something I call just blatant overt discrimination. You know, if the world did not know that race discrimination was still alive and well in 2017, 2018, they didn't have to look much further than Charlottesville. This was a long time ago, and this was last year in Charlottesville. That was 50 years ago. This was last year in the streets of Charlottesville. The world knows we have to know discrimination. Racism is alive and well in this country. The people in this room know that because you've been fighting these battles. You see it. I've seen it. But so much of America somehow wants to deny it. I want to talk for about, quickly about two cases that epitomize that overt discrimination. One's been mentioned. This was Zanesville, Ohio. Back in 2008, we had a trial there. Let me tell you quickly about the facts. The city of Zanesville had, of course, clear, beautiful water that they treated in their city plan. Coal Run is a neighborhood that has been historically, for over 100 years, African American. About 120 families live there. And the story in Coal Run was that Coal Run could not get water. Now, why did it matter? It mattered because out in this area, the Coal Run area, the name Coal Run comes back. This is coal mining country. You can't dig deep enough to get to good water. The coal shafts go so deep that you just can't get, you can't drill a well and get fresh water. So the folk in Coal Run, they had to bring in the water, truck it in, and put it in cisterns. But when you put water in cisterns, what happens is it gets polluted, gets infested, it, it, and in summer times when there isn't that much water, it dries up. You don't have it when you need it. There was never enough, and it was polluted. The water plant was about two miles away from Coal Run, and the pipe went right down Adams, Adams, Adamsville Road. And if you look at where the folk lived, the white folk lived largely along Adamsville Road, and the African-American folk lived in the Coal Run neighborhood, and for years they tried to get water. These are the water pipes. We showed this in opening statement of a two-month-long trial. These are the water pipes. You can see they go everywhere. They go miles and miles out to Muskingum County, but they went around and above and over and under, but they just didn't stop in Coal Run. Now, of course, the, we're, the, the, the county said a lot of excuses. The folks never asked, they said. It was too expensive to, to deliver it. Um, of course, we dealt with all that, but the picture says a lot about what actually did happen. The stories of people were incredible. I mean, the humiliation, um, not being able to take a shower. Many of the folk who testified at trial didn't take their first shower until they went to college. They reused the water. They used it first to, to cook with, then to clean with, then for, for the outhouse. There was a verdict. Um, after a six-week trial, we waited two weeks for that verdict, and the water came, and $10 million, $10 million in damages came from the jury. One of the most profound moments in my life was 
to have a courtroom packed in Columbus, Ohio with folk from Coal Run who were there to hopefully see history. And when we went back to Coal Run and met with everybody after that verdict, there were a lot of tears, there was a lot of, a, a, a lot of hugging. And then one gentleman stood up, he, he, was, he was older, and he said, the money is great, he said, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is we're in the history books. Now everybody knows it was discrimination. Right? We're in the history books. Second case I want to talk about quickly is not in Ohio. It's down in New Orleans. It's down in the south. Back in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina happened, St. Bernard Parish, which is 98% white, bordered the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, heavily African-American up there in the upper left. And at that time, there was such a history of racism in St. Bernard that they said, we are going to, we're going to barricade the bridges coming across the Industrial Canal because we don't want any black folk coming over into our county. And they gave orders, the Sheriff's Department gave orders to shoot to kill anybody who came across that bridge. Shoot to kill. This is 2005. And then in 2006, just to make sure that folk didn't move in, they passed something called the Blood Relative Ordinance. And what that basically said was, if you live in St. Bernard, if you live in St. Bernard, and you own a home, and you want to rent it, you cannot rent it to anybody who is not related to you by blood. And they even defined how many generations it had to be back. We were notified by the Fair Housing Center of New Orleans, and we brought a lawsuit. We drew a very courageous judge, Helen Berrigan, down in, in New Orleans. We challenged that. We said, that perpetuates segregation. That's an all-white community saying, we're not going to let anybody who's not related to us by blood move in. How can that be legal in this day and age? She said, you're right. She struck that ordinance down, and she issued a consent decree. Two years later, we were contacted by the Fair Housing Organization again because they said, something's happened. There is a company called Provident Realty. They want to build affordable housing. They are attempting to move in, not move in, they're attempting to build in St. Bernard. And what happened was that when Provident Realty out of Texas started to, to say, we're going to build housing, the St. Bernard Voice, which was the newspaper, said, hey, what's going on? What is this affordable housing that's moving in? Should we be concerned? Is this going to bring in a criminal element? And the next thing that happened was, after being told, yeah, we need housing in St. Bernard because we just had a massive flood and we need affordable housing for first responders, Provident was told, you cannot come in because we're passing a new ordinance that said we are stopping multifamily housing construction. We're stopping it. No more multifamily housing. We don't need it. We don't want it because they were concerned that folk from the Lower Ninth were going to be moving in to this housing. They were concerned that there would be a significant African American population. We said that violated the consent decree. We came back down. Long story short, three years later, multiple hearings in front of the judge. St. Bernard government was held in contempt. This was some of the comments, by the way, that were, um, that came out in the Times Picayune when we brought this lawsuit. Whoop, went a little too fast. Um, during the construction, this is what, what went up. On, on the construction as Provident courageously continued to build. And then, in something I thought I would never see in my lifetime, this was the St. Bernard News. And on one side, you can see it says um, prosperity, I'm sorry, property value. And up at the top, it says state and local rights. Those are the local officials that we were going after to hold in contempt. And on the right is the director, James Perry, of the Fair Housing Center, and Judge Helen Berrigan. Um, and it says, federal jurisdiction, fair housing underneath. This is George Wallace in the schoolroom door. And this was in 2012. 
We went down there, multiple hearings. They were held in contempt, not once, not twice, but the third time Judge Berrigan said, if you do not issue the permits to build this property, it will be $50,000 a day fine for the parish and possible imprisonment. And they finally, finally constructed it. It was, I mean, Providence was allowed to construct it. It was, it, was, it, was, it was finally done. I will tell you one story. The one time in 30 years of litigating all over the country that I actually was concerned about safety was at this time. Because at, at this time when we were going down for the final hearing in the Times-Picayune, there was a comment that said, these people wrote in on the internet and said, Relman, Dane, and Colfax is the law firm that's bringing this. We are locked and loaded. And the hearing date was set, was announced. And I tell you, you know, that gave me a feeling of, uh, of connection with what had happened 50 years ago. Because I have to say, I was looking over my shoulder a little bit when I walked into that federal courthouse. Um, so for those who say it doesn't still exist, it does. Now, in the recent Supreme Court case, the impact uh, that involves the disparate impact rule, that was a seminal case, Judge Kennedy cited this case as one of what he called the heartland cases. And so I tell you this because discrimination is alive and well. One major part of the reason why we still see these statistics and why things are still so sober for us in terms of how much progress have we, have we made is because in towns and counties and hamlets across the country, we have to face the fact that discrimination still exists in our face, in our face, overt, racist, right there in front of us. But there's more to the root cause. There's one other type of case I want to mention before I get to a couple of thoughts, lessons, final sort of closing thoughts about how we tie this together and where, where there is hope. There's one more thing, a type of case that is the root cause. And that's something I call structural racism. What is structural racism? Structural racism, it's a term that gets used in different ways, but it's a practice that exploits historic discrimination and spatial segregation for private or political gain. Let me say that again. Historic discrimination exploits ex historic discrimination and spatial segregation for private or political gain. That's just a different way of saying that racial justice and economic justice go together. So history teaches that as power and profits can be extracted more easily from communities that have been historically denied basic rights, it will happen. It is just some of the politicians we know all too well in this country or past politicians, as I mentioned, George Wallace, that for political reasons exploit underserved communities and communities that have been historically denied rights, they will do it because it advances their cause. And where companies and moneyed interests can exploit those without power to make more money, somehow, some way, they find a way to do it. And let me give just two examples of that. So, Back in 2008, we brought a case on behalf of the city of Memphis and the city of Baltimore against Wells Fargo for predatory lending. Not just predatory lending, but predatory lending that was targeted against the minority community. So this shows, and what we were concerned about was the foreclosures that were happening. This shows just foreclosures generally. I mean, there were just thousands of them happening in Memphis. If you looked at Wells Fargo, we started to look at their numbers on behalf of the city. What we saw first was that the high cost loans, that's the predatory loans, were largely in the minority neighborhoods. The, the darker the color, the, more, uh, the, the, lar the, the greater the minority population. And look at where the low cost loans were. These were the prime loans, the good loans. They were largely in the white community. And when we looked at the foreclosure rates, we saw that the foreclosure rates were so much higher in the minority community than in the white community. And, and I said, how can that be? I know that banks use automated underwriting. They have models that tell them whether you're at risk or not. How could, with these empirical models, and banks have to get this right to make money, they have to know who's going to default, they have to know who's going to be late paying, how can they be seven times more likely to get it wrong based on the color of a neighborhood
doesn't make sense. Why is it that in African American neighborhoods, they're seven times more likely to get the prediction wrong and have people foreclose? Unless there is something else going on. And in fact, there was. When we brought the case on behalf of Baltimore and Memphis, ex-employees came forward and told us we were trained. Beth Jacobson, I mean, these were, these were employees of theirs came forward and said, we were trained to go to the minority communities, go to black churches in, in, in Baltimore, and sell high-cost loans to people who we knew qualified for low-price loans. Why? Because we could make money at the time of closing, and we could unload those loans on the secondary market, and banks like Deutsche Bank and Fannie Mae and others, Citibank, they would pick up the risk because they buy these loans, and we make our money and we could move on. And they told us exactly how they did it. And it wasn't one employee, it was multiple employees came forward and testified. The Justice Department ultimately came into the case. We brought a lawsuit on behalf of the cities because we said the cities have been damaged because they have to pay to clean and stabilize these properties. They have to get foreclosed. They have to pay for police and fire department protection. And those costs are real to them. And we documented those for the court, how many times these properties had been boarded. The same thing was true in, in, um, in, in, in Memphis. Um, and Sorry, uh, same thing was, was true in Memphis. And so what, what are the lessons that we take from these cases? Um, and there's just one more example of the structural racism, Peoria, Illinois. This is, involves a chronic nuisance ordinance. So the way this is Peoria, you can see the African American population lives in the southern part of the city. And what happens in Peoria is that if you have, the city said, we're going to try and stop, we want to stop what we call chronic nuisances. So the ordinance defines a chronic nuisance as a property where there are what's called three eligible offenses. It can be the most minor code violation. And if you have those three, then, and defined by the police, you can be cited as a chronic nuisance property. And if you are, the penalty is that you could go to prison if you're the owner of the property, or you could pay a fine. You are told you have to abate. The way that you abate is to evict the person who has the apartment that gets cited for the violation. That's the way the police want it done. But the police have the ability to exercise their discretion in who gets cited as a chronic nuisance because there are so many properties that qualify potentially that they choose where they're going to cite them. We plotted where it happened in Peoria, um, working with Matt Desmond, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted. This was the, this was the practice that, that Matt had explored in Milwaukee. And lo and behold, look at where the properties were that were named as chronic nuisances. Almost all in the African American community. What happens to folk? They get evicted. What does it mean if you get evicted? perpetuate segregation. This is a way to make the city of Peoria whiter in the simplest form. The police department has something they call the armadillo. The armadillo is placed in front of houses that are cited as a chronic nuisance. The city tracks where the armadillo is. We said, let's look and see online where it is. We've now plotted where the armadillo was placed. The armadillo is placed in African American communities. Pure tactic of intimidation. Pure tactic of intimidation. Again, structural racism. All right. As I, as I bring this now to a close and pull this together, let's connect the dots. What are the lessons from these cases? What are these two types of cases, the overt and the structural, tell us. Because the structural can be based on sometimes market forces. You know, Wells Fargo will say, hey, we just went where people had the need for these loans. That's just where the market took us. Right? The first thing, first lesson I draw is that poverty and race, or economic justice and racial justice, are inseparable in America. What do I mean by that? I mean, you can't talk about one without the other. They just go together. Dr. King knew this. What was he doing 
in the month when he was assassinated in 1968, in April of 1968, he was in Memphis for the sanitation workers' strike. He was bringing a war on poverty because he knew it was also a war that had to do with civil rights. The second lesson is this. As long as we live apart, we will never have economic or racial equality. This is the lesson of these cases, that discrimination and deprivation, it's possible, it's possible because people live apart. There was no water in Coal Run because the folk knew in Zanesville, they knew where the black folk lived. If it were integrated all throughout the county, they could not have systematically denied water to African American folk. There was no affordable housing in St. Bernard Parish because that's where the white folk lived. That, they didn't want to build it. They were able to deny that affordable housing because they said, we know where black folk live. We, we, can, we want to preserve the all-white character of this community. If it were integrated, it couldn't be done with an ordinance that says no multifamily housing. It just wouldn't work. The predatory loans could be targeted to African-American neighborhoods in Memphis and Baltimore because those neighborhoods were defined. In Baltimore, you know where the black churches are. You know where the black folk live. The same thing is true in Memphis. I could say the same thing about Peoria. The chronic nuisance works to perpetuate segregation because you know where the black folk live. Dr. King understood this, and he understood that the fix to this is living together. It's integration. So we have to get this right first. And third, the third lesson is, the way to get past race is not to hide from the problem, but to shine a bright light on it. We've got to confront it. It's an ugly, ugly part of our history, but we have to talk about it. We have to face it. Brian Stevenson who just opened this incredible monument to lynchings in Montgomery, Alabama, one of the great civil rights leaders one of the great criminal defense lawyers of our time, has said, there was truth and reconciliation in Nazi Germany. Well, not in Nazi Germany, but afterwards in Germany, about what happened in Germany during the Nazi time. There has been truth and reconciliation in South Africa, where people have talked about apartheid. But as Brian says, there has never really been truth and reconciliation in this country. Has there ever been an apology? Has there ever been a debate about reparations? We've never had it. We have never truly talked about it. We talk about our being post-racial, but we don't talk about the consequences that we live with of slavery and Jim Crow. I say to people, it's like you have a race, and you start the race, and half the people in the race have to wear a ball and a chain, and you run that race for a certain number of, a certain amount of time. And then halfway through, you say, we're stopping the race and we're gonna make it all fair. The ball in the chain comes off and now everybody can run. Everybody's equal. Well, guess what? Guess who's more likely to cross the finish line first? The folk who didn't have the ball in the chain. And who are they? They are white folk in our country. But we don't wanna talk about the consequences of that of 450 years. So my point is we can't fix this problem unless we address the underlying root cause. How much worse it is for minority communities than anything that similarly situated white communities face. And if equity has been stripped out of African American communities at greater rates than white communities, then our fixes have to address that fact. We can't just ignore it. If there's a disproportionate rate of harm, there has to be a disproportionate rate of remedy. And you know, in, in, a, in an important, uh, in a very important book, How Democracies Die, by two professors at Harvard, Professor Levitsky and Zeblatt, one of the things they say is that you know, when Reconstruction failed, there was a grand compromise after the Civil War where we went back to the Black Codes, we went back to Jim Crow, and for the next 80 years, until Martin Luther King came along in the Civil Rights Movement, we simply engaged in a policy of racial exclusion. The way that we got past 
What was the biggest polarizing factor in our history, the Civil War, was to make a compromise between whites in the Republican Party and whites in the Democratic Party where they could make their compromise, but African Americans were left out of that compromise. We can't ever go back there. We won't. The, we're, we're way past that now. The challenge we have is whether we're going to get to a country of economic equality, a country where we don't have these cavernous differences in economic disparity, but we have a society that is racially diverse and racially just. No democracy on this earth has faced that challenge yet and succeeded, has been able to have a racially diverse society and an economically just society. That is our challenge in America. That's what we have to do. That's where we have to be focused. How do we get there? And I want to say one more thing. This is the biggest question we all face now going forward. Everyone in this room, everyone in the next generation, this is the issue. This is the challenge to our democracy. If we don't close this economic disparity gap, our democracy is not going to survive. This is about the survival of our democracy. We will go the way of other countries where yawning gulfs in disparities, the shrinking of the middle class has led to authoritarian leaders and the cutting back on true democratic freedoms that we count on. At the same time, my message to you is we have to get racial justice right because we can't do one without the other. We got to do them both and we got to face the fact that we have to do them both. That's our challenge. All right, how do we get there? The first thing is we've got to continue to reveal the truth. History does that. We have to tell that history like we're telling it today, but we also have to remember where we came from. It's been 50 years since the Fair Housing Act, but it's been 450 years of slavery. We've got to remember it's been a short period of time and a long period of time of the deprivation of rights. Cases do that, litigation does that, studies and editorials and speaking truth to power does that. We have to do all of those things. The warriors in this room have to continue to bring cases. You have to write editorials. You have to stand up and talk. There have been more editorials in the New York Times talking openly about our racist past and what it means in the last six months here than I've ever seen in my lifetime. It's harder with structural racism. It's easy to talk about it in some ways with cases like Cole Run and St. Bernard Parish because the facts speak for themselves. The cases about structural racism are harder but we've got to face the fact that financial institutions target student lenders in minority neighborhoods. We've got to talk about the effect of criminal records bans in housing. Landlords who say, if you have a criminal record, you can never live in my property. What does that mean for the overwhelming numbers of largely African American and Hispanic men coming out of prison today? We've got to talk about it in terms of um, immigration and what it means there and what we're doing. We've got to protect the tools that allow us to bring these cases. So we've had disparate impact. We've had something called affirmatively furthering fair housing. We've had these important regulations that the Obama administration put into, into, into power, into effect. Now the current administration wants to roll them all back. Our firm is bringing lawsuit after lawsuit to stop that, those rollback of these important rights. We're a country of laws. We're not a country of, of edicts, of verdicts from an executive branch. Second, we've got to focus on policies that encourage and foster integration. And this last slide that I just want to show you is, and then I'm going to wrap up, is, is an amazing map because this is the DC area. And in this map, the, the DC all over on the right, this is, this is the change from 26, in 2016. This is from 10 years before. And you can see in that sort of chartreuse area, that's the African American population. And, and that area has grown larger as DC has been gentrified. And you can see in that diamond shape in the middle over on the left, that's DC proper. And you can see in the Northeast, Black folk have been moved out, and they're moved out into PG County. But what I really want to show on this map is the blue areas. 
The blue areas, look and see up in the north how they have grown. Those blue areas in this map represent the highest areas of integration that we have. That statistically means more folk of different races and ethnicities living together in those areas than anywhere else. And by the way, uh, that's it, when you see over in Virginia, that green, that is integrated um, uh, uh, Hispanic and white. Hispanic and white and Asian American and white. But if you look at those integrated neighborhoods, what has caused that? The best answer is those are counties in Montgomery, areas in Montgomery County that have, have put into effect inclusive zoning, saying if you're going to build market rate housing, you also have to provide affordable housing. So that's a story that says that works to promote integration. Okay, so policies that work, protecting these tools, identifying the issue, talking about it, and remembering that race, racial justice, and economic justice go together. There's one more thing, though, that we have to do. We have to remember that fair housing sits at the center of it all. Fair housing, where we live, tells us more and defines more about all the other rights combined than anything else. Where you live determines what kind of job you'll have, whether you'll be able to vote, and what the restrictions are likely going to be, what your educational opportunities are going to look like, what your wealth is likely going to be, what the connections are that you're going to make, what kind of... Their housing is at the center because spatial segregation is about the center. It is the center of our problem. As I said, the stakes are high. I believe it's really about the stability of our democracy. And this is a challenge. I think it's a challenge, though, that I view with optimism and hope in my heart because I believe that when we pull together there's literally nothing that we can't achieve. Dr. King was an optimist. He was an optimist. Every time I read Dr. King's words, I am charged up again. Describing him to a country that did not know him in, in 1956, the New York Times wrote this. This was a profile about King. He said, quote, among his convictions are these, that all men are basically good, that ultimately good will triumph over the evil in their nature, that segregation in all its aspects is evil and that ultimately it must be swept away. Think how far the power of those convictions moved us as a nation in the short space of his lifetime. Just think about that. One man, one man who was not afraid to speak the truth, to speak his convictions. Reflecting on his life, 50 years of the Fair Housing Act and 30 years of litigating fair housing cases, I remain convinced more than ever that the path to a truly just society, one that provides for economic and racial justice, requires us to do everything we can to promote policies and laws that bring people together, that build stable, inclusive, and integrated neighborhoods. It is the only way we will learn to understand and accept, even if we cannot love our brothers and sisters, our fellow travelers, in this one life we have together, on this planet. And to this challenge, and this is what I say to you today, we have to bring perseverance, true conviction about the nobility and the righteousness of our pursuit. The answers, they don't come all at once. It's a long journey. It's a struggle. 50 years is not long in the 450 years of history and slavery and discrimination in this country. Progress has been slow, but it is real. And our job now is to stay the course and to pass that torch on to the next generation. Thank you.